say is this, before we even get into the whole issue of how do you communicate well about pro-life issues, uh, the first thing I'll say is this, and, and uh, hopefully no one's too shocked by this, but if you're looking for a popular cause that you raise at dinner parties, you know, well, I'm, I'm pro-life, <laughs> uh, and you get a good reaction, uh, this is probably not the cause to, you know, in polite company. It's uh, my, um, my, my dear mother-in-law, who's a lovely lady, but for a few years didn't know how to tell people what I did. And so uh, we discovered that she was telling people I was in social work. So um, she kind of, I suppose that's true, social work. Um, now, uh, but, but if you're looking for a popular cause, really being pro-life is not the one where people are going to instantly pat you on the back and go, oh, great, I love you guys. I know, oh, this is excellent. Um, ending plastic, the evil tyranny of plastic bags in supermarkets, that's a popular cause at the moment. Um, now, I'm not saying anything bad about that, but that's, you know, that is popular, I love you. Uh, anything to do with the environment, animals, saving animals, that's, these are all very comfortable and safe forms of activism or issues to, to be part of. But once you start talking about the issue of abortion and human rights and the fact that you are pro-life, and maybe there's a better way to be doing this than what we currently are, not even anything too, too out there outrageous, for some people, that's just too much. So uh, I think we've just got to we've got to lean into that. Now, when I say lean into that, I don't mean be idiots. And this is, I guess, the point of this presentation because often people they'll say, "Well, I was at this dinner party and I raised the issue of abortion, and everyone hated me and they threw food at me, and I'm so persecuted, you know, and, and I must be doing something right because I'm being persecuted." There's two types of persecution. There's a type of person you, persecution you get when you're that person in the room who stands up and tells the truth when it has to be told, and people don't want to hear it. The other type of persecution is when you're just an idiot, okay? And so you step up and say really dumb things, or even true things, but in the wrong way, in very dumb ways. And we can all, I've been prone to, I've done this myself, and so I'm speaking from experience here. And so uh, it's important to understand that, that we can communicate well and intelligently about this. And I think one of the biggest things, regardless of... Uh, how, I guess what it is you're trying to communicate is humility goes a long way. And just, you know, we don't have to stand there as a moral authority lecturing down. We can maintain a very strong moral stance from a great position of humility. And I think some of the things I talk about today might help sort of reinforce that in the way that you communicate. Related to that, there are no quick fixes and there is no substitute for actually turning up. I'm not here today in the session to give you a whole lot of gimmicks. Well, if you do this, all of a sudden, all of your friends will want to sign up to the pro-life cause. It's as easy as one, two, three. It doesn't work that way. That's not how the real world works. That's not how real human engagement works. Human engagement is a complicated thing. I talked about the book, The Righteous Mind, before. Fascinating book. And it looks at the research around why people become so defensive and also it's over politics and moral issues and, and why they take the positions often they do. And it's interesting, a lot of the research shows us that most people aren't actually reasoning their way to their moral views. What they tend to do is they, have, they tend to have a more emotional intuition about whether something's right or wrong, and then they do post hoc reasoning to try and justify the intuition, the feeling. And so it's important to recognize that. So on the one hand, Ben Shapiro is right when he says, you know, facts don't care about your feelings. But on the other hand, I would say it's a very dangerous way to engage with people because people don't tend to engage with issues purely on a hard, rationalistic, feelingless, emotionless kind of way. And so I think it's important to recognize that. But there are no quick fixes and there is no substitute for actually turning up. So when we talk about social media, for example, in this session, some good practical skills there, don't ever let that be a substitute for actually being with people and being in community and having conversations with people in the real world. Don't just do all of your pro-life activism, quote-unquote, online and nothing more. Be present with people in the real world. There's no substitute for engaging and forming those kind of relationships. There's a guy, actually, that my mate Matt and I, we go hunting with a bit now. And he comes with us, and he's a guy who's had some pretty big struggles in his life recently, and, and he's coming at these issues from a very different perspective. But what's happened is as that relationship is built and strengthened and we spend time out in Arthur's Pass, and we, we went off overnight over um, Boxing Day, and it's fascinating. There's just an openness to having a frank, honest conversation that he has because there's a relationship that exists between the three of us, and he's willing to have that conversation. And so I think that's important. There's no substitute for turning up. But here are some fundamentals when you think about discussion with people about this issue. Number one is compassion absolutely important think about the fact that you never ever know who you're talking to what their background story is it can be very easy to pass judgment on people without actually knowing what their background is what their experience is what's driven them to adopt this position 
Now, your compassion can't become false compassion. And there's a danger in that, and it's important. There are times when you have to say hard things, even when people don't want to hear them. Right? You, you, what you can, you can, it's an interesting situation. You can definitely have truth without compassion, but you can never have authentic compassion without truth. You just sort of bury the truth. We won't talk about that, and, and because that makes people uncomfortable, and we think we're being compassionate, we're not actually, gen, that's not genuine care for that person, to hide what is true from them. However, there is a way you can present the truth that is just blunt, and it's like blunt force trauma, and it's like hitting people over here with a hammer that can actually lack that authentic compassion and care. You never know where someone's coming from. And I've seen this time and time again. Um, a friend of mine in another part of the country, and this guy is, there's no way you would call this guy a pro-life counselor or social worker or anything like that. This guy was a tradesman. He's an awesome guy, and I love him to bits. But he's just your soul to the earth kind of tradie. And, and, and he's, he's, he's just a real straight shooter. He's not, he, he doesn't finesse words. He'll tell you the truth. But he's a guy who, who lives it and really means it, and he does care for people. So he's not a guy who has clever little arguments and, 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 and knows how to nuance, say, a counseling session with someone. You'd never make this guy a counselor. But he had an experience where someone was waiting for him one Saturday morning outside in a, pro a property where he was, and he had a van that he was driving, and he had some big pro-life statements on the side of the van. And there was a woman angrily pacing the footpath, waiting for him to appear. Total stranger. Is this your van? And then she began to remonstrate with him and get angry with him. And he just had the conversation with her from that place of compassion. He didn't compromise what he believed. And what happened? A very fruitful dialogue ensued. It turns out that she'd actually had, I think it might have even been more than one abortion herself. By the end of it, she'd given him a big hug and she was in tears and was thanking him for the opportunity to speak frankly about these issues. And I think one of the things here that's really important to, to, to recognize is that you've got to be prepared to push through and, and be prepared for what I call first reactions or initial reactions. People's initial reaction often to something pro-life is to get angry. But if you're prepared to actually say, let's just let that reaction sit and press on ahead with the conversation, once you get past that, a lot of really good and deep dialogue happens. What's happening often, though, is a lot of people are thinking, oh, we don't want the first reaction, so don't say anything because people will get upset. And we don't go deep. We stay superficial and nothing good actually happens. So don't be afraid of those first reactions, but always from a place of compassion. Stay calm. It's important to stay calm. Don't be weirdly calm, though, because in some circumstances, if you're sort of looking like you're some sort of weird zombified robot creature, as someone is passionately sort of barraging you, it can kind of seem a little bit weird. So, so don't be too calm in the wrong way. But don't lose your cool and, and allow this to become... It's, it's, not, it's not warfare against this person. This is really a conversation about truth and about error, about the good of human persons. And as I said, it's, it's, it's a, that, that beginning place of compassion allows you, if you try and ground yourself in that, to say, okay, even if this person is just firing all sorts of animosity at me, it doesn't mean that I actually have to join in with this. I said this recently on my YouTube channel that some people today want us to effectively become monsters in order to defeat monsters. That's not how you do that. And it's really dangerous. It is a bit of a, what I would call the Nietzschean tendency that has come back from that sort of uh, Frederick Nietzsche idea of the strong man rather than the, than the morality of what he called herd morality or master-slave morality that was too much about humility and things like that where they were out of control, out of order. And I would say there's a danger in that. It's, it's actually not about, you know, we must dominate this other group to prove how right we are. It's about that genuine place of, of humility and, that, and staying calm is a fundamental part of that. And what's interesting about staying calm is often it's not even about the other person. You might have other people who are watching, whether it's online or in a conversation in public, where they're watching to see how people conduct themselves. And they're waiting for you, the pro-lifer perhaps, to become that wild-eyed, erratic and dangerous clinic bomber that they think you really are, because that's what everyone told, has told them they are. I've heard stories, fascinating stories, um, about a, there was a, an ex-abortion clinic worker, a senior worker, who basically, her conscience began to play on, and she wanted to get out of the industry. And she met with the only person she knew who was a religious leader. And the reason she met with this religious leader is because he'd put out a plea, and he said, well, if there's anyone in the industry, no judgments, my door is always open, I'm always happy to have a coffee and just talk. Now, she went, though, and she was petrified, and she told him during the conversation she was actually petrified, because a lot of her co-workers and friends within the sort of pro-choice movement had told her these people are dangerous, they want to hurt you. That was the perception that they had. Now, staying calm actually undermines that and shows an actual fact, no, 
we don't need to join in that absurdity ourselves. Stay on track. It's important to stay on track. Now, when we talk about the issue of abortion, for example, I think one of the biggest issues, if you're having a discussion like about the ethics of abortion, that big question I talked about this morning, what is a fetus? That's the fundamental question that demands an answer. What is it? We often want to go all over the place and talk about all these other issues or jump to the fringes and not actually stay on track and explore those fundamental questions. What often happens in a dialogue is people will throw out 50 different arguments at you. Oh, yeah, yeah, but what about this? What about that? What about rape? What about life of the mother? Well, what about when they can't afford it? You've got three different things coming at you all at once. Stay on track. Just, just peel it back layer by layer. Focus on one. And it's much better to have that kind of fruitful and full conversation than something that's all over the place and isn't really staying on track. Don't expect instant change. It just Generally speaking, it just doesn't happen. That's not how you change your position. Think about your own life where you have changed, say, an intellectual stance that you've held or a moral or ethical stance where it shifted. I'm pretty confident that most of us, it didn't happen just like that. It wasn't like this bolt of lightning. Oh, I see. I speak, spoke to Owen, and now I understand. Owen, I've been so wrong. How did I join your club? That Generally, that doesn't happen. What tends to happen is people, we are prideful creatures, human beings, and we like, the worst thing is to be told that we're wrong. And so what happens is we like to go away and think about it. And, and often what happens is, as people go away and think about it, that really gives them that opportunity to think more deeply. I think that's a really good thing. Even if someone goes away frustrated, I'm okay with someone, if someone goes away from a conversation with me saying, how could that Malone guy think that? What an absurd thing to think. Why am I okay with that? Because they're thinking about it. The person who goes away and goes, oh yeah, well, there's nothing happening. If you want to get a result, you first got to get a reaction. That's one of my principles I think is kind of important, the right kind of reaction. Um, and, uh, but, but don't expect instant change. Allow people that space to actually think about it and, and to come to a fuller understanding of these issues. Know when to quit. If something is just getting out of control, whatever form of communication it is, if it's just becoming unproductive, you've got to actually know when to knock that on the head. Now, I know for the guys at university here, I think this is probably a more common problem. The person who's done perhaps uh, one year of philosophy or, I don't know, they've watched a few YouTube videos and they kind of think they've got the whole world figured out and they turn up to a pro-life stall and then when you start unpacking the pro-life logic and pointing out, for example, that if we were going to accept the pro-choice position on abortion for abortion, we have to logically accept it for infanticide as well because every argument you use or almost every argument you use to justify abortion will, can also be used to justify infanticide. So why don't we? And if you wouldn't accept infanticide, why do you accept abortion? You sort of reverse engineering that important question for someone. Now, the good, well-meaning, rational human being who's honest will say, hmm, that's an interesting question. I haven't thought about that. The person who's just trying to be, I guess, a troll will say, oh, well, let's have infanticide as well then. And, and, and then they'll deliberately sort of carry on from there. And you know those kind of conversations. It's important sometimes just to, to stop and say, okay, well, this is kind of getting out of control. Uh, one thing I'd say is don't, don't walk into a dinner party with your friends or your family and say, hey, folks, how about abortion? Let's have a conversation about that. It's not the place to start from, right? And, and if you're having a conversation, and I've had conversations with people where I can see that it's just the emotion of it's just too much. Know when to be that, that person who, who comes from that position of genuine compassion and care for people and just pulls back a little bit. Okay, be careful with your analogies. This is really important. A lot of people love to use the Hitler and the Nazi analogy, okay? Just be careful with your analogies. I'd say just, now there are some times when you, well, I spoke about Nazi ideology this morning, but I think the context of, of that was fear. But you do, you do have to be careful with your analogies. And, and I'd say don't just go to the Nazi analogy and say, oh, this is a big problem we've got in our discourse today. Everyone's become a Nazi for some reason. It's now the thing. Some of you might have seen that meme that's doing the rounds on the internet, that little golden book with Hitler riding on a magic carpet down a rainbow. And it says, uh, everyone, I, everyone who disagrees with me is Hitler. And it's this little golden book. Now, you don't want that, right? You don't, that's not what you want. And it's not good. It's not good for a couple of reasons because in actual fact, most of the time it's not even correct. And it's an unfair judgment, an un unfair character assassination of a person. Secondly, it's a real big problem because as Douglas Murray points out in his book, uh, The Strange Death of Europe, if we just run around calling everybody Nazis, then ultimately no one can be a Nazi. And when real Nazis turn up, no one recognizes them anymore. It's a real problem if you misuse terminology like that uh, and, and you abuse it and you call people who clearly are not those kind of things. Uh, so be careful with your analogies. That's really important. Make sure your anal no analogy is perfect, by the way, but make sure at least it has that basic soundness to it and you're not using some weird extreme analogy. 
and also challenge logical fallacies because they're very common in any sort of discussion. We can all fall prey to them. I'll give you a couple of examples of the most common logical fallacies, and they can really derail a good, genuine conversation between two people. Number one is the fallacy of, of ad hominem, and the most common way this happens is where you uh, call the person a name instead of addressing their argument or their position. So if I'm having a conversation with someone and, and I say, well, uh, I believe that a fetus is an, an innocent human being, all innocent human beings should have their fundamental right to life respected, therefore I think abortion is a grave injustice. I've put forward an argument there, I've, made, I've said this is what my position is. Now, uh, Andrew, I'm having a conversation with Andrew, Andrew turns around and says, oh, you would say that because you're just a pro-life nut job. You probably blow up abortion clinics in your spare time. Right, what's he done there? He's called me a name, he's insulted me, but he hasn't actually engaged with the actual argument. And in that situation, what I would tend to do is I'd say, well, that's very good, Andrew. You've called me a name, but what do you think about that proposition that I put forward? What's wrong with it? Do you think it's false? Where is it false? Um, another common one is, is uh, the straw man fallacy, where someone constructs a completely false version of what your argument is, and then they burn it to the ground like a straw man, and they go, ha ha, I won that debate. And you're standing there going, yeah, but I, I don't believe that. I never said that. Oh, you pro-lifers want to put all women in prison. And, and, and uh, that's an awful, terrible thing, and you lack compassion. Ha ha, I won the debate. You're like, but I never said that. I never ever said that. So the straw man fallacy is very, very common, it's, uh, and it's important. And, and it's one thing to do. I often say to people, if I'm not sure, I will say, can you just clarify? So if I was having a discussion, say, with Owen, and I wasn't quite sure, I would say, are you saying this, Owen? Rather than assuming and then responding. I, I want to know for certain. Traditionally, that's how philosophical discourse would take place. You would actually start by clarifying uh, your opponent's position. And the reason you did that was to ensure that you weren't creating a false version of it, and then you would respond to it. Uh, another couple of examples are appeal to authority. When people say, well, uh, you know, but uh, Barack Obama says it's fine, or, uh, or Jim Bolger was okay with it, or, or you know, whoever it is, they appeal to some authority as if that somehow is what makes something true or false. Uh, an appeal to popularity is another one. Well, you know, 90% of people agree with me. It doesn't mean anything. 90% of people can still be wrong, right? So it's, it's not what, you know, majority vote is not what determines what's true or not. And so it's important, I think, to, to, to actually challenge those gently and hum, in humility when they do arise, but do challenge them. Um, and I would say this as well. Whatever form of communication you're engaging with on pro-life issues, don't forget about the powerful importance of the question. The, the power of asking a question I'll tell you why. You could get on social media and you could just, you could go away from this and think, I've got to say something to my, my social media people about what I heard today and this is such an important issue. You could make just a bold statement about it, a moral statement and you could get all sorts of reactions or you could phrase that exact same bold statement as a question. I was at this event today, what do you guys think about this idea? And then you put the bold statement in a question. What happens? People are less confrontational and they're more willing to engage in dialogue with you about that issue. Don't ever forget the power of a question. The, the right question can undo all sorts of very weird and even dangerous ideas. Just someone at the right time ask the right question. And just the way it's phrased, you're not trying to, to, to aim for the person. You're aiming at the flaws and the logic, the flaws and the thinking, the the the, uh, the philosophy which is going to lead into trouble. But the power of a question does it in such a way as it invites people to dialogue. So let's have a look at some various ways we can engage in dialogue with people and some practical things to think about. So first of all, and the big one now is social media. A lot of us are on social media, a lot of people are using social media. Obviously, social media is a great thing because we've got some amazing opportunities. But we've also got some really big potential risks here we need to think about as well. So the amazing opportunity, of course, is that we can instantly reach, reach a very large and global audience with our message. That we, you, know, you could never do that before. In order to do that, you'd have to buy airtime and you'd have to buy it all around the world. Think about what, what used to be involved in reaching a global audience with a, with a message. I got you, bro. Just keep going. 
Okay, so we can instantly reach a huge audience that we couldn't do before. You'd have to pay a lot of money to do that. And so that's, that's a phenomenal advantage that we now have uh, in regards to um, what social media gives us. But there are also, yeah, they're back on. So there are also some serious risks involved here too that we need to think about. So the first thing when I, say to, when I talk to people about social media use, I think it's important to think about it is, is it the icing on the cake or has it become the whole cake? If we're trying to be totally pro-life and only on social media and nowhere else, there's a bit of a problem there. It should be the icing on the cake. There's no substitute for turning up. There's no substitute for community. We don't want a, a sort of pro-life engagement with the culture around us that kind of looks like this. Okay? We don't want to be doing this solely on social media. It's the icing. There's some great things happening on social media. It's a great information sharing tool. But you still have to connect with real people in the real world. The biggest flaw, as I said, the biggest problem I said in my last presentation is the loss of authentic community for people. And that's not fixed by just sitting on social media all day. There's also a bit of an issue you need to be aware of with narcissism. There's a bit of a narcissism trap that social media can draw us into very easily. As the cup says here, I'm kind of a big deal on a fairly irrelevant social media site that falsely inflates my ego. And it's a real common problem. Oh, well, I, you know, the whole world has to know about... I saw a funny meme today about this, actually, um, and a particular celebrity, you know, who had said uh, recently that, you know, I'm, I'm an important person, and that's why I had to tell people on social media what my views were. And then the below it, it had a picture of the earth, and it said the, the, the earth before the celebrity, the earth after the celebrity, you know, and nothing has changed. But, but that's the thing, we can, we can fool ourselves, and often there's a danger in that, because we can end up being very uncharitable, or we can be unhelpful in our own cause, in effect, um, by, by, by getting too caught up in ego. This is a painting, uh, or a photograph of a painting that, um, it's, it's actually Caravaggio's Narcissus, but my brother painted this copy of it, hangs, it hangs in his garage in Sydney, actually about that high. But, um, but Narcissus looks at himself in the pool, right, and he's like, oh, this guy's quite important, I quite like this guy. You know, people probably want to hear what this guy's got to say. And that's the sort of thing that we can get stuck on in social media. The second thing, of course, is clicktivism. Sometimes it's called slacktivism. Now it's called virtue signaling, quite commonly. We get online and we signal to the world how virtuous we are. Oh, I'm so outraged by this abortion thing. It's so awful. It's so terrible. But, but that's all we do. That's the danger. We get stuck in that place of just signaling about our outrage and about how virtuous we are, but never being virtuous. This cartoon sums it up perfectly. Uh, you know, you've got a woman who's out in the street. Help, please, someone do something. What's everyone doing? They're helping, quote unquote. Um, hashtag united with her. Hashtag doing something. Hashtag blame Bush, so you can tell how old this cartoon is. Uh, hashtag uh, ban knives. Right, what's going on? No one's doing the one thing they need to do. Being in the world and being virtuous. All right? and, and, that's, and we've got to be careful of that trap if we're going to use social media to actually convey a pro-life message. The other thing to be aware of with social media is, and particularly if you're in a comment session, section discussing, discussing pro-life issues with people, is that online disinhibition effect is a real problem. Online disinhibition, disinhibition effect, as the name suggests, is where you get online and your inhibitions go out the window. And a couple of ways this manifests is people, their brain tricks them into thinking, because they're looking at a screen and nothing more, oh, no one else is around, no one's watching, and they just start firing off all sorts of things as if no one's watching. The other way this happens, and quite commonly in discussions with people, is that your normal empathy mechanisms in the brain don't kick in like they should. Because if I see a person face to face, I'm registering. In fact, facial recognition is one of the most important things we do. We seek out faces. Our brain does this. It's a very important thing as human persons. And so our empathy mechanisms kick in. We're having a conversation, a dialogue. Owen and I are talking about something. And all of a sudden, Owen starts weeping. And then he's, he's in a ball on, on the floor in the fetal position sucking his thumb. And I know I've gone way too far at that point, right? And so I sort of withdraw, and, and hopefully at the very least I'll say sorry, but at the very least I'll probably withdraw from that, oh, I've gone too far. I don't carry on. Oh, oh, and come on, mate, what's wrong with you? Don't you see my pro-life reasoning? So, but that's what we do online effectively. We get online, Owen's lying there in the fetal position, and we go, oh, come on, mate, you know? And, and we just go and go and go. Because our empathy mechanisms don't kick in. We're forgetting there's a real person on the end of this. And we often say or do things that, you know, that we wouldn't necessarily do if they were in the room with us right here and now. So here's six fundamental rules, six that I think are important for effective engagement online with people. Try and be proactive and not reactive. So actually have a positive vision that you're trying to present to people. You're not just reacting. Oh, that Andrew said something. Oh, God, how dare he? He needs to know that I'm important. I'm going to tell him, you know, and smashing away at my keyboard. That's reactive. Don't be reactive. Um, don't personalize disagreement. It's, it's a disagreement. This person's not your enemy, and they're not Hitler. 
Don't personalize it. Oh, I'm being attacked. How? Well, they're disagreeing with me. Well, that's not attacking you. you know, there's nothing, nothing bad's happening to you there at all. But we, we very easily tend to do that online. So be very careful about that. This is a human person. So don't personalize the disagreement. Pause before posting. Before you post anything, even if it's proactive, you're not responding to someone, you're just going to post something on social media. Stop and think, why am I doing this? Could I say this in a better way? Is there a bit, should I even post this at all? Pause before posting. Go and, what I found really helpful is go and make yourself a cup of tea and come back and then have a look at it again and see whether you really want to say what you're about to say. It's amazing how just doing that is really helpful. I, I post a lot less on social media now than what I did a couple of years ago. So I've actually found it's more fruitful and productive to actually stop and just not post at all. I've, I've, I was over the Christmas holiday break, I had a bit more time on my hands, and I was sitting at home one day, and I was about something in the news, and I had some really clever, witty post that I was typing, and I was like, about two paragraphs, and I thought, no, just deleted the whole thing and went back to playing with my kids, right? Best decision I made that day, probably for everyone else as well. Um, but, but you know, just stop and give yourself that space to think, is there a better way of doing this? Listen to what people actually say. I've lost track of the amount of times I've seen people in discussions online, they're not listening to each other. And I've even seen people arguing at cross purposes, that they're basically in agreement with each other, and they're still still going at it as if they're, they're mortal enemies and, and the other one must be defeated. Actually listen to what people are saying. I saw a, an example with a pro-life group once where someone got on their social media page and, and asked a question and they wanted to become a donor but they just had heard a few little things and they wanted clarification. Genuine donor, someone who was keen to support the organisation. The people, whoever was running the social media for this organisation, misunderstood what was going on and then launched into an attack on this person. Like, and it was the most bizarre thing unfolding online. You was back and forth. This was a person who wanted to support their organization. And if they'd actually stopped and listened and just responded properly with a bit of humility, you know, they would have had another donor in their camp. But they didn't. They didn't listen to what was going on. If in doubt, always assume the best. If someone posts something, you think, what do they mean by that? Is that satire? <laughs> you know, or, or do they really mean that? You know, assume the best. Don't assume the worst. And I've often done this with comments or statements where I'm not quite sure where they're coming from, and I've assumed the, the, the best, and I've responded in kind. And even if they weren't often, it actually helps to, to take all of the, the heat out of it, and, and it's been a more fruitful sort of dialogue with someone. And I, I would also say related to that, use your smileys, your little emoticons. That, now, where it's appropriate to do that, if it's inappropriate, don't do that. Sorry to hear about the death of your father. Smiley face, smiley face. That would be an inappropriate use of emoticons, right? So don't do it in those kind of situations. And if you're not careful, it can kind of look like sarcasm. So just be careful. But I often do that now to people, particularly people I know well, but just people in general to show, hey, I'm not sitting here in anger and red hot rage bashing away, you know, throwing darts at a photograph of you. I'm actually trying to engage with you in a meaningful way. Three things to think about when using social media. Pausing, pondering, posting without pride. Uh, without pride. Pause before you post. Ponder what you're about to post. And try and post without pride as much as possible. It's not always easy to do, and we all struggle with this. But, but that's, and I would say this too when you're in a conversation with people about pro life issues, keep your phone. My phone's not even here today, I left it in the bedroom where I'm staying. If, if, if you're, keep your phone in your pocket. We've studied this, and we know that even having your phone out, so a lot of people, you'll see them do this now, they take their phone out and they turn it screen down. So they're having a coffee with someone, the phone comes out on the table or both phones, and they put it screen down. They go, look, screen down. We know, we've studied this, even having the phone in your eye line actually causes quite a powerful form of distraction for a person. You're not giving them the fullness of your attention. That self-giving community is missing. So just put it in your pocket. The other thing I do is I talk about pockets and, and, and planes. So keep it in your pocket as much as possible, and, and airplane mode is a really handy thing. And so what I'll regularly do is when, um, uh, the last thing at night, because I use my phone as an alarm as well, uh, so before I go to bed, I put it into airplane mode, and I don't take it out of airplane mode until the last of my children has been dropped off the next morning. Just, I'm there present with them. Now, I'm no saint, and I've got plenty of issues and struggles with this, but I think it's important to remember that if we're going to use this as a communication method, we need to use it well, because it could be an absolute disaster for us if we don't. We don't just want to get caught up in that outrage machine that seems, you know, what's the latest outrage? I'm going to join in that outrage. Don't, don't form outrage mobs. Do something more positive and proactive with it. If you ever find yourself in the media, this is actual mainstream media, you're walking down the street, you're at an event, and someone puts a camera in your face and says, can I talk to you about this issue? Now, I don't have time to go into full media training. When we run Activate, we go through a full couple of sessions on media training and interview techniques and things like that. We're not going to do that here today, but I'm going to give you a couple of pointers. Number one, smile. 
Smiling is important. Again, unless it's inappropriate to do so. Okay? You, you wouldn't talk about the death of the Prime Minister with a big smile on your face. That would be inappropriate. But most of the time, smiling is a good thing to do. And I think especially in this situation, I know about a situation where a, a young pro-life leader, the, the media came to photograph her, and they came to photograph her, and they really were looking to drum up a bit of controversy. And I remember saying to her, because I was advising her, I said, whatever happens the next day with the reporter and the photographer, just smile, no matter what they ask you to do, smile. Because they wanted to get a recreation of this event that had led to a bit of controversy. So she, she smiled as they're recreating the event, they take the photo, and sure enough, I think it was six times, the photographer said, ah, can you stop smiling, we need to retake this photo. She kept smiling. What ended up on the front page of the paper the next morning? Big, beautiful, smiling pro-lifer, right? It's, it's, it's a powerful sort of image. It's, you know, and, and so, so smiling actually is a good thing to do. Um, think of one key point, and then just keep making it, no matter what question is asked of you. So you're, you've been ambushed, I don't know, you're leaving the event today and some cameras turn up. You know, and, and think of one key point that you want to make that you can make well. Just one statement. Call it your key talking point. And then keep making it. So Owen's outside, he's waiting to ambush me. And he says, you know, what's going on here with this reactionary anti-woman group? And I say, look, mate, this is all about human dignity. We're here, to offer, we're here talking about offering women better solutions and, and, and finding a more loving and authentically self-giving culture. You know, that's just a, an idea. And I keep repeating it. And Owen says, oh, but what about this? And I say, well, look, that's interesting, Owen. But our real focus is on, you know, providing better options in a more loving, self-giving culture. So, and, and, and that, you can just repeat that. And all you have to do is start by saying, well, that's an interesting question, but, well, that's a good point. However, our focus is, and you just shift back to what you want to say. What happens is then when they go back to edit the footage, they've really only got one idea from you that they can edit into their show. And, and that's a better way to do things. So just think of one idea and make it well, smile on your face, and never repeat a negative. Never repeat a negative. There's a, there's a great example of this involving Shane Jones. Um, you might remember the scandal with Shane Jones where he, he took his uh, official was it ministerial credit card or government credit card, whatever it was, and he was overseas in a hotel room and he bought a pornographic movie. And I think it was the Herald who asked him, are you a sex fiend? Now that's a negative. He repeated the negative. He said, I am not a sex fiend. What happened on the Herald the next day? Big photograph of Shane Jones. Headline, I am not a sex fiend. What do you think? Shane Jones, sex fiend. Shane Jones, sex fiend. That's what you think. That's the association you're making. Don't repeat the negative. I've had organisations uh, where, you know, how would you respond to the allegation that your group is making women feel unsafe and harassed for the choices that they want to make? Now, I think the way to respond to that without repeating the negative is just to say, well, our organisation is focused on the well-being of caring for women, and that's where our focus is, and that's what we do. Don't buy into the negative. Now, it's not always easy to do that, but remember, if you can avoid repeating a negative, now, isn't this just about you anti-choices? What about those abortion clinic bombers? Don't repeat the negative. Just say where you come from. Say, and, and, and very clearly and positive, what it is that you stand for. Talkback radio. Talkback radio can be a very effective space, believe it or not. I know that might sound hard to believe at times, but it can be a very effective space. And you can actually open people to new ideas if you do it well. Uh, it can also be a disastrous space if you get it wrong, but it's, it is not uncommon still for political parties just to keep their ear to the ground. I mean, what, are, what, are, what are people saying in the letters to the editor and, 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 and on Talkback Radio about policies and issues? It, it's, it's, it's a place that, you know, it is worth having a dialogue. To do that well, I'd say, first of all, don't do any cliched things when you get on there, okay? Um, don't get on there and, and start by saying, oh, you know, hi, Owen, love your show. I'm a long-time listener, first-time calling. Don't do any of those kind of cliched things. Don't get on there and say, I really have loved your show for a long time, Owen. It's, you know, and this is such an important issue. If you start saying that, the host is going to know straight away that you're an activist, that you've, you know, you, you, what, what do you mean it's an important issue? You know, you, you're trying to butter them up for the next thing. But what you should do is do try and make the host an expert, not an enemy. Right? You're not at war with them. Even hosts that can be quite hostile and, and have very disagreeable ideas to your own, Actually start by asking them a question. This is where the power of the question comes in quite handily. You know, I, I've been thinking about it. So Andrew rings up and he says, well, Leighton, I've been thinking about this issue and I've, there's something I've been wondering about. And then Leighton goes, oh, Andrew wants me to help him with an answer, <laughs> right? He's become an expert now. We all like that kind of thing. And then phrase it in the, in the form of a question. So ask your question. You know, people were saying, you know, we should have this abortion. Uh, we should go up to 22 weeks. But, uh, but 
you know, I've, I've been thinking about this, and you know, the baby's heartbeat starts somewhere between five and six weeks after conception. That sounds a bit strange to you. It sounds strange to me. It sounds strange to you, Leighton, right? And see how you've got a really important point out there. It hasn't been confrontational. You haven't been cut off, hopefully. Uh, and, uh, and you've actually started a dialogue. And the other thing related to that is know when to quit. And this is one of the big pitfalls I've seen in talk back with a lot of people, is they ring up and they make a really good point, and the host will go, wow, that's a good point. I never thought about that. So good, Owen. Why didn't I not think of that? And then Owen goes, oh yeah, the host really likes what I've got to say. I think I'm a bit of an expert. And then they ask another question, and, and Owen all of a sudden goes on a, off on a tangent. Yeah, 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 right. I think Hillary Clinton is a lizard person. I've been watching, I've been reading a lot of materials. I think she's a lizard in human skin. And everyone's like, what? What did he just say? And every point he made before that point is now completely undermined. So don't hang around. Make your point, do it well, and then just say, that's all I wanted to say. Thanks, and then hang up. Visiting your MPs. Visiting MPs is important. And it's going to become more of an issue as if this abortion issue progresses, which it looks like it's going to, into the stage of, of the government putting a bill before Parliament, then visiting your MPs is going to be important to speak to them. Here's the thing about visiting MPs and how to do this well. Never ambush them. If they're out opening some new shopping mall in your district or your election, don't ambush them. Oh, I'm here to talk about this abortion issue. You know, that's not going to go well. Don't do that. Or like my local MP, who I need to have some words with, and he is uh, his children go to the same preschool as mine. And I saw him the other day, and I was really tempted to say, hey, come, we're going to have a chat. But I didn't. I thought, no, that's not fair. I'm ambushing him. Uh, he's here to, kid, to drop his kids off at one of his children off at preschool, not to be ambushed by me. So, so actually make a proper appointment to see him in their office. Uh, when you're in that appointment, never threaten them. Now, obviously, I, this, this sounds like people wandering there all the time and threaten them, but I mean in the sense of, if you don't vote this way, I'm not going to vote for you anymore, mate. Don't do that. You can say, look, for me, this is a vote-changing issue, but don't issue it as a, a great edict from on high. I declare that my vote will never be for you, good sir. Don't do that. People don't react well to that. It just doesn't go well. And most MPs will assume that if you care about an issue enough that it is a vote-changing issue for you, um, remember that your time will be very limited with an MP. They don't, as much as we think we are, you know, we should warrant all sorts of time, we will have very limited time with them. I mean, if you're lucky, you might get half an hour, but that's a pretty rare exception with an MP. Often you might get a, a space of 10, 15 minutes at most to have a conversation with them. So to be aware of that and go in with that understanding. What do I want to say? How do I want to say this well? Don't underestimate the power of a story as well in any of these settings. People react well to a story where you can actually relate uh, the position you're trying to make to an experience you've had. It helps people to connect, I think, with the issue without some of those confrontational aspects of it. Um, uh, be careful with your handouts. Um, this is really, really important. So basically, a lot of people think, okay, I've got 10 minutes with my MP. I go in there, I say what I'm going to say, and then I'm going to give them this hour and a half DVD documentary about life in the womb, and they're going to watch it. You know, they're not. They're just not. They're not going to do that. Even, oh, I'm going to give them this book, or I'm going to give them this series of pages. Here's what I'd suggest. If you want to give your MP a handout, which is not unheard of, put all the information on one sheet of A4, A4 nothing more, and don't use size 6 font, right? All crammed in there. Just nicely laid out, lots of spaces on one page. I would say two at most, but even two are starting to cross into sort of cardinal sin territory. Stay within that one page if you can, and just a couple of key bullet points on it, so you look at it and they don't think, oh, this is too much to read and throw it away. Just a couple of quick points. Communicate well. They're not going to watch a movie. They're not going to read books, so don't do that. And lastly, when you're writing to your MPs, actually visiting them is an important thing to do. It's a very good and important thing to do. It's very effective. More effective than sending them an email. And if you're going to write to an MP, don't email bomb them. I can tell you right now, I've got several friends who are MPs both here and in Australia, and they'll tell you the exact same thing. They just switch off. They have auto filters now that will filter out certain subject lines. They're not interested in email spam. I'm telling you, it doesn't work. What will work is a handwritten letter because they get so few of them. It is like this gold standard. It's like, what has happened, you know? Someone has uttered something from the mountain. It has come down before me on these, these sheets of, of, of parchment. It's a, such a rare thing to actually get a letter now that you're more likely to engage with them that way. So, and handwritten, not typed up. So, so use that to communicate with them. Letters to the editor. Again, they're a great tool. Uh, now, here's the thing you can do with letters to the editor. is It's like playing the lotto. You know, you increase your chances in the pool. If you get a few mates together, 
and you'll write different letters. So not the same letter, because that's obviously a bit pointless. But you, you write on an issue, and say three of you write three different letters from three different, or touch on three different themes on that same issue. Now, if one of you gets published, great. You know, if two of you, well, awesome. But if, you know, if there's only one of you, and that one letter gets rejected, but if there's three of you, and, one of the, and two of them get rejected, you still come out the other side of it better off. So actually, having people write letters together is a good thing. Uh, obey the word count. Absolutely obey the word count. I, I can't tell you how important this is. You might think that you have written the most important letter. You know, this is going to be like Martin Luther King's letter from a Birmingham jail once people see this. I've got 3,000 words here. No, nah, trust me, that's not how this, they're not going to go, wow, let's publish this. That's not how this works. If you're submitting a letter to the editor, which is different from an op-ed piece, and by the way, anyone can submit an op-ed piece. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be world-renowned. You don't have to be a celebrity. You can write an op-ed piece, five to 800 words. And you could say, this is, send it into the editor and say, this is for the opinion page. And, and try your luck. Anyone can do that. Okay, so do that as well. But if you're writing a letter to the editor and the word count is, uh, is 200 words maximum, don't go 300 or even 250. Go 150. Try and stay under. Okay? Uh, and as I said, if you've got people who are a couple of people writing letters together, then, you know, you can touch on different themes in your letters uh, you don't have to say all of it in your one letter and make it really long. Pick one theme only per letter. Try and stay focused on one theme. Write, say, 100 good words with a focus on one theme, then say 150 average words about three different themes that you're trying to touch on. Just, just do one and do it well. And again, don't forget the power of a question. Asking questions is, is a really, I think, a good and important thing to do. One last quick thing just to finish up this part of the session, as I, w I will say in relation to media, is... Um, I think cinema offers a really, it's, I'm a bit of an amateur cinephile, I like cinema, and, and I think it, it offers a really great way, some of the stories that are in cinema, to actually have discussions. So I gave you an example before uh, from the movie North Country. It's a really profound way to have a deep ethical and profound ethical conversation with someone about, about this issue of abortion after sexual assault or rape. And, and I, what I want to do is just quickly give you a couple of, a list of some other films that I think are great little doorways into these kind of conversations or are worth uh, worthy conversation starters. I'm not necessarily recommending that every one of these would be family movie night movies, okay? Just just be aware of that. You go home and watch this with the family. Oh my gosh, I didn't realize this is what this was. But they can be a good conversation starter. So the movie Juno is a comedy, and it's actually quite a good comedy that it's, in, in a really quirky and wry kind of way. There is some inappropriate content in there. Just be aware of that. It's not a kid's movie. Um, but it also, but at the same time, it actually, it, it, it um, satirically, um, had a go at the, at the abortion movement, actually, uh, in some places. But it's this fascinating insight into, into an unplanned pregnancy and choosing life for a child and how positive that can actually be. Um, a Quiet Place, which is a new movie that's come out with uh, Emily Blunt and John Krasinski. They're actually husband and wife. He directed. They both star in it. And why this movie is so fascinating, it's a movie about a, a future post-apocalyptic world where these creatures, we don't know where they've come from, but these creatures have basically destroyed most humans on Earth. And what they've done is, um, or what they do is they react to sound. They hear you. If you make a sound, they will come and get you. And the story is actually about, it's a primarily a family drama. It's about a family who are living out sort of in this rural setting. Most of the film, there's no dialogue. They communicate. One of their daughters is deaf, and they communicate by sign language. And it starts, the film starts, their youngest son at the time has been lost. He made a noise. They were walking back from a store in silence. And he turned on a battery up at toy and, and his life is lost. And so it starts from this place of family tragedy, but now they are pregnant with a new baby. And it's this whole thing of bringing this baby into the world despite the struggles and the suffering. It's got some really profound themes in there. Bella is a, a classic but a, a great uh, little pro-life film, again about an unplanned pregnancy. It's sort of more of an indie type film. Uh, Gravity with Sandra Bullock. A fascinating film. There's lots of little images and imagery in there about rebirth and, and about uh, hope even after suffering. Uh, Children of Men, which is uh, Alfonso Cuaron's movie adaption of the book by P.D. James of the same name. And Children of Men is about a future world in which uh, all women have gone infertile. So the oldest child at the start of the film is 18 years of age and the film starts, he's just died. A, a deranged fan has stabbed him to death and he's the youngest person in the world. And it's the whole thing explores what happens to a world without the voice of children in it. What happens to a world without children? 
And it's a, it's a very, the film itself, it's some pretty full on moments in it, but it's a very profound exploration of, of the, the profound importance of, of, of new life. And, and there's also, so th there's a beautiful moment where, so basically the, the, the story is that there's a guy who is, he works for the British government and the, he is made aware of the fact that the very first pregnancy has happened in decades. And it's this young African refugee girl, and he's tasked with getting her to safety uh, across Britain in this sort of very dystopian future. Um, Gattaca, written and directed by a Kiwi, Andrew Nichol, very good film about eugenics and the value of the human person and human equality. You know, and should we be engineering the perfect person? Should we be, uh, you know, removing those who perhaps aren't considered perfect or as good as the rest of us? Um, the Curious Case of Benjamin Button. This, the theme of this is human dignity. The curious case of Benjamin Button, for those who don't know, the, the, the central premise is you've got a, a, ma a baby that is born as an old man. And as he ages, he gets younger and younger and dies in his old age as a little beautiful infant baby. And the director, David Fincher, who's a phenomenal filmmaker, said that uh, the reason he made this film was he wanted people to understand human dignity. And he said, we look at babies when they're born and they can't clothe themselves, they can't feed themselves, they often, you know, they poo themselves and you have to change their nappies and we go, oh wow, beautiful. Why don't we look at elderly people in the same state in that same way? Why don't we see their dignity, their human dignity under this? Very profound message. Uh, Hacksaw Ridge, um, this is not necessarily one for family movie night, but um, some pretty full on war scenes, but it's a, very, a true story about uh, Private Desmond Doss who uh, single-handedly saved a whole lot of men from Hacksaw Ridge. Now, the interesting thing about Desmond Doss was he went to World War II and ended up on Hacksaw Ridge as a, uh, as a um, conscientious objector. And he wanted to go and join and, and do his part, but he, wouldn't, he refused to pick up a gun. And what he did is he went in as a medic. And initially, they tried to kick him out. He was treated badly. They tried to do all sorts of things to get him to, to resign himself from the army, and he didn't. And then he goes over there and saves all of these men's lives. It's profound. The movie actually understates how heroic some of the stuff he did was. You look at it and you think, this can't be real. It was, and even more so. Um, but the thing about that film is it's about freedom of conscience. That's the point. And this is a big issue when you think about the abortion issue now with a lot of medical professionals who are being told in scenarios that their conscience should be conformed to what the system expects of them. And so this is a really important movie on that theme of freedom of conscience. And so, so finally, Sophie Scholl, The Final Days. Sophie Scholl, The Final Days, one of the best German films that's, that's been made. And it's, it's a uh, film telling or retelling of the final days of the life of Sophie and her brother Hans Scholl. And what they did was they formed the, the very first pe peaceful, overt anti-Nazi resistance in Germany. And they formed this group they called the White Rose. And they were caught one day... Uh, leaving leaflets that spoke out against Nazism on a university campus. They were caught, they were arrested, and they were charged with treason, and then they were subsequently executed after a trial. It is a profoundly beautiful story about commitment to truth and human dignity, and it's the kind of film that you watch and you think, man, if they went through that, I can probably have a conversation with someone about this issue without being too worried. In fact, I remember being in Sydney a couple of years ago to speak at an event, a training day like this actually, and the organisers called me and said, we just wanted to let you know before you get here, there's a whole lot of protesters outside and they're screaming and they're making a whole lot of noise and you're going to have to walk through them. And my first thought at 7am that morning, Saturday in Sydney, was I wish I was at home with my girls watching a Barbie movie. Now, you know, as a bloke, there's something's going a little bit wrong in your life and that's your first thought. I wish I was watching a Barbie movie. And, um, and... Then I thought to myself, hey, Sophie Scholl, she, she was actually willing to go to a guillotine. I think I can actually walk through a few protesters. And, and I did, and actually turned out to be a very fruitful kind of thing. So it's a profoundly beautiful movie about courage in a time when the culture might not agree with you.